Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed lunch and whatever other activities you were up to. Uh, we are, as you know, now going to discuss the state and future of the American workforce. Very important topic, obviously, for everybody here. We're all many members here are members of the American workforce. Many of you employ significant parts of the American workforce. And I think everybody is very focused on the questions of whether or not the American workforce has the skills right now or will have the skills in future, will be equipped with the skills necessary to enable the US economy to grow, to continue to grow, to enjoy prosperity, and of course to compete in an increasingly competitive international environment. And we've got a terrific panel here where we're going to address all of these issues, both from the policy perspective, but also from uh, the perspective of uh, companies, uh, private sector companies, as well as from the government. I'm going to start, the con going to start this afternoon's session, though, with a conversation by just the two of us with uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, Wilbur Ross, whom you all know very, very well. Um, Secretary, thank you very much indeed for being thank here. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and I want to ask you, the President established the uh, American Workforce Advisory Board right. um, just earlier this year, I think it was, to precisely to address some of these issues, that these very pressing issues that everybody is talking about. Could you start off by giving us a sense of what the objectives of that advisory board are, what you're doing, what you hope to achieve, and what the, what the needs are that you, that you hope that that board can address. Okay, well that might take up the whole session. Okay, <laughs> I'll That's try fine. to be more brief. I'm happy to see everybody has the pledge forms in front of you. We hope you'll all fill them out. What it's about is we've already signed up companies to provide 7,500,000 apprenticeships over the next five years. And we hope if all of you commit, maybe we get to eight million before we leave the room. That gives you a feeling for the dimension of the problem. Work is changing. It's not that there'll be less work, it's just it will be qualitatively different work. And we have a barbell of problems. At the older end, you have 111 million Americans who are more than 50 years of age. And that's the most rapidly growing segment of the population. It's also the part that's most vulnerable to displacement by technology, because it's a little bit harder for people that age to adjust to new things. The other problem end of the barbell is the young people under 25. Whereas something like uh, 30, 8% uh, of Americans who are working age don't regard themselves as being in the workforce. Namely, they don't have a job and aren't seeking one. But 44% of Americans under 25 are in that category. That's really bad because that's the future. And if they become too embedded in being out of the workforce, you'll get into behavioral problems Skills will be harder to come from. You'll have opioid problems. You'll have all kinds of things. So we have several different kinds of problem with the workforce. They're all solvable. It takes willpower. It takes cooperation, public and private sector. Um, but we think it's doable. One of the things that really concerns employers is the skills mismatch, the, yes. the gap. You talked a little bit about that. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, I think there are various estimates as to, as to how, you know, how many unfilled jobs there are as a result of there simply not being, you know, we have a very tight labor market, obviously, right now in the United States anyway, but there is a skills gap between the skills that employers need and the skills that workers are equipped with. Talk a bit more about that and give us a sense of how that can be addressed. Absolutely. I think the tragic truth is the American educational system is failing the young people. It is not equipping them the way it should. And again, there are two different dimensions. We have the least vocational training of any OECD country. That's horrible. And there's social opprobrium to being headed in a non-college direction. When I was a kid, which is quite a little while ago, it was routine. Some kids were heading one direction, some the other. Nobody thought the lesser of it one way or the other. Now there's this terrible fiction that you must go to college to be successful. Well, the truth is 40% of all college graduates are working in jobs that don't require a college degree. 
and that in turn has resulted in a strange economic disequilibrium, namely the bottom half of pay of college graduates is lower than the top half of pay of high school graduates. Think about that. So half of each thing is totally mismatched to the fiction uh, about you have to go to college. The other problem that that fiction created was the student loan crisis. You've got 42 million Americans with student loan debt. I think the average is something like 32,000, but many of them are far higher. So those are people who gave up several years of income, now their balance sheet is ruined, and many of them still don't have a college degree. 36% of students enrolled in four-year colleges do not have a degree after six years. So those are people who've really been hurt, both their balance sheet and their income statement. So we have to dispel some fictions. And it was well-intentioned, the idea everyone should go to college. The only problem is, like a lot of good intentions, it wasn't fact-based. The facts are it's wrong. Before we come to the panel, and I do want to get a broader discussion going, one quick more question on this to you. One way in which the US has traditionally filled a lot of its skills gaps is through immigration. Um, US has been uh, a very open society, has welcomed a lot of uh, immigration, and some of the most successful people in this country we all know have been uh, immigrants. Right now, could you give us a sense of what the administration wants to achieve with this immigration policy? Obviously, immigration is quite controversial. There's a lot of illegal immigrants, which the administration is clearly trying to uh, crack down on. But in terms of the skills, especially, again, in a tight labor market, and in a labor market where there don't seem to be right now the skills that a lot of workers have, what's the administration's approach towards um, allowing or embracing significant numbers of immigrants to come in and to do those jobs? Well. Administration is not against immigration. It's for lawful immigration, and especially for lawful immigration of people who have skill sets. We would like to see something changed at the graduate level where we're now deporting people that we have paid a lot to educate with STEM knowledge that we desperately need. And yet under the present system, we deport them so that we can import the products that they produce in other countries. That doesn't make any sense at all. So I think what's unfortunate is that unlawful immigration has become a blurring factor about holding us back from lawful. Uh, both the H-1B visas for uh, skilled people and the whole idea that we pay a lot to educate foreign students and then we kick them out really is, is silly. It's a waste of resources. But you would like to, you still want to maintain a good flow of immigrants to come here with yes. an H-1B visas or other types of visas sure, to fill those but jobs? Sure, we like the idea, the kind of Canadian system, the Australian system, where it's more merit-based, not lottery-based. I mean, lottery system... It's, it's just the luck of the draw. Why is that the way you should select people? You should select people to help the country meet the needs that it has. Much more sensible to pick it out and have a rating system of some sort. So there are a lot of things, but like everything else in Washington right now, it's become so politicized. My guess is not a lot of progress will be made on that, at least until after November 2020. Thank you, Secretary. Um, speaking as an immigrant myself, I have, a, I guess, a particular vested interest in this, but uh, my, uh, that's, that's uh, beyond my family's uh, concern now. I want to broaden this out now to include the representatives of the private sector here. Let me introduce them, first of all. On your extreme left, uh, the audience's extreme left, uh, Bernard Harris, CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, um, and he's going to explain a little bit about what the National Math and Science Initiative gets up to. I should also say he's a former NASA astronaut, so um, he has... <laughs> a particularly high-altitude experience on uh, some, of, some of these areas. Um, next to him, uh, Barbara Humpson, many of you know, of course, CEO of Siemens USA. Please, yeah. 
and a member of our Workforce Advisory Board. You've just stolen my next line, but thank you very much. That's fine. <laughs> we can secretary. move things along more quickly. And next to her, Jonathan Sokoloff, Managing Partner at Leonard Green & Partners, a private equity firm. <laughs> Barbara, let me start with you, if I may. Exactly as the Secretary says, you are a member of the Workforce Advisory Board. From the private sector, from your company's point of view, more broadly from the, from the private sector's point of view, what are, you, what are your objectives? What are you hoping to achieve? Ah, yes. It, this was a very welcome phone call I received from the Secretary. It's a real privilege to be here today and, and talking about this subject. As Siemens, we are an active American company, 50,000 employees across all 50 states, um, every year engaging in hiring really at all levels of the company. So the opportunity to be part of a dialogue about uh, the, the future of the American workforce is really exciting. If I may, just quickly summarize the four objectives of the board, if you haven't heard it already. I mean, first, Let's work on creating multiple successful pathways beyond the four-year college degree. Second, let's take a look at how we make job opportunities transparent to candidates across the country. Third, what if we looked at the, uh, the job that employers are doing in ensuring that jobs have the right qualifications required, so we're not over-specking jobs, if you will. And then finally, how do we encourage and engage businesses in developing workforce training programs and helping them understand the return on investment of, of investments in human capital? So these are the four objectives we have. And when Secretary Ross called, he said very clearly, we're action-oriented. <laughs> <laughs> what we want to do is identify things that can be accomplished within the, the lifespan of our, of our board. So by December of next year, we want to be done and with actions in place. And I have to tell you, it's been exciting so far to work with my colleagues because we are out of the blocks quickly. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I want to break this down into, there are, there are obviously many ways in which we, could, we can approach this. It's such a broad and important subject. There's obviously the issue of training and retraining of existing workers, and there's the question of education and the, the long-term future and what needs to be fixed in the education system. I'm gonna, if I may turn to Bernard, Bernard from the National Math and Science Initiative, if you would explain to us, you're very much focused on the need to improve math and science skills um, in, at the school level and at, at the educational level. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what you do, what your organization does? And I know you've got some slides as well that you can show us that can, yeah. that can take us through that. So let me start by saying that the National Math and Science Initiative has uh, really three core uh, things in which we do. First is that we are one of the largest providers of advanced placements in the country. We do this in high schools all across the country. Sorry, Bernard, I don't know if we, are we seeing the slides? I'm not sure if there was... I'll, I'll call it for them in a second. Okay, okay. all right. And, okay. Um, and then, uh, secondly, uh, we do a lot of professional development in terms of a program called Laying the Foundation, which uh, goes into primary and secondary education and schools and, and provide STEM training for teachers. Because uh, if you look back at your history uh, in high school, if you go back that far, and you realize that the subjects that you love the most was probably taught by someone who is very knowledgeable in, in that field, and whether it was chemistry, biology, for me, it was my, my science teacher. And so, uh, so we want to make sure that the teachers have the training that they need for that. And lastly, we're into teacher preparation. We have a program called You Teach, which takes uh, college students who are majoring in STEM, and they end up with the ability to teach. So they end up with a teaching certificate at, at the end of that. So if we could put up that first slide again. Uh, that was just my general commercial about uh, the impact that we, we have around the nation, over 2 million students in which we have engaged, uh, 35,000 teachers in which we've educated during the 11 year history. Uh, we're in 45 universities with our training program, uh, trying to get, of course, young people knowledgeable to become, become teachers. And we've trained about uh, four, over 4.5 uh, um, or 4.5 thousand or 4,500 uh, uh, teachers. And so that's what we do. Now, when I was asked to, to uh, sit on this workforce panel, uh, if we can go to the next slide, one of the things that we are really big advocates for is to make sure that students are prepared when they go to college. So the advanced placement is around um, 
uh, college and career readiness. So the secretary mentioned a, a stat earlier that your kids may go to community college or they may go to colleges and they end up taking longer than they should. And part of that problem is that they're not prepared. So we want to make sure that they are prepared. And why is it important for them to be prepared? Because they're going to be going into jobs that require math and science uh, education and training, whether they go to college or whether they go uh, into vocational schools. And so you can see on this slide that, you know, in these fields, it's going to grow about 13% a year. Uh, there are going to be 2 million jobs that uh, within uh, five or six years are going to be required in STEM. That means that we have a lot of work to, to do. And when I talk to young kids, you know, being an astronaut, I get a chance to get in front of high school uh, students, and I uh, ask this question, I say, how many of you want to be rich? And uh, they, of course, everybody raises their hand. And I tell them that, the, that uh, if they want to be rich, the way to do that is the more education you have, the more opportunity you have, opportunities you have to, uh, to become rich or wealthy, however you define that. So that's important. So, and one last thing, if we can show my last slide, and I'll, if we can put that up. One of the things, about 2017, uh, we looked at ourselves as an organization and uh, looked at our programs, which are national programs, and we said that there were areas in the country there where there was a lack of STEM education. We call them a STEM desert. Uh, as we begin to research that, of course, the question is, what constitutes a STEM desert? And so we brought together about 50 uh, experts uh, from various organizations around STEM to figure out what are those things, what are those factors that enable STEM success? And we called them our STEM framework of success. And then we took those elements that this group put together, and they created about 114 of these, which we call indicators, as you'll see in this slide. And we begin to map that. And so we are currently mapping at the state level, but the plan is to map at the district level and at the school level. And why? Because we want to make sure that communities are aware of their capability of, of, uh, of uh, teaching their students and preparing this next generation. So that's what this, this is about. And you'll see that we listed a, I listed a couple of indicators there. Uh, policy and funding are important. Educa education training is important. And I highlight it since we're in California. Uh, just one of those things, and you'll see there, and, and this is the student's preparedness in science uh, as, as a, um, uh, by use of the ACT, whether they are prepared or not. And by the way, let me back up if I didn't say this, is that these indicators are all from publicly, publicly uh, sourced. <laughs> so they're already readily available, and this is the first time that we put all of this together. Thanks, Minot. Secretary, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I think to frame the problem, the work that MMSI is doing is immensely important. I don't think we can overstate the importance and two statistics to frame it. Only 25% of 12th graders rank as proficient in math, 25%. Worse yet, another 25% have such limited numerical skills, they do not know how properly to read a monthly pay stub and understand what got deducted for what and what they get. Those are two appalling figures. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, he's helping to fix it. Sometimes employers like to keep it that way, though, don't they? That's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that's too anti-employer for my team. Let me, um, uh, I want to, again, broaden this out. We'll stick on the topic of education right now. You see these tables constantly published around education levels around the world. And the United States, on balance, doesn't do very well and is constantly beaten, especially on science and math, on STEM, by countries in Asia, Singapore, Korea, Japan, but also some countries in Europe. It's, it's, it's kind of middling. And yet one of the conundrums is the United States has this extraordinarily also, you know, um, solidly uh, successful higher education system, great number of um, great number of global uh, global level institutions, the highest number in the world. 
What, let me, let's go, so go, going back to the issue of STEM, and in particular in the K through 12 level, Jonathan, let me come to you for your perspective on this, and I want to ask all of you, what's wrong? Why is the US failing there? When it manages to succeed in so many other respects, what is, why is the US faring so badly, it seems, on these scores for uh, STEM performance in schools? Well, it's a, it's a broad question, and there's lots of issues with our education system, but I think some of the trends we're seeing is that you know, the focus towards STEM and, and uh, you know, computer science and whatnot is, is moving quite rapidly. And uh, in, in many of the universities, you know, uh, uh, coding and computer science is one of the fastest growing majors and colleges are having a tough time hiring enough, you know, teachers to meet the demand. So I, and then we had a discussion for our kids' high school, should coding be a required course as opposed to English or math or used to be typing? Mm. And I think there is a, an, an unstoppable wave of, of technology education that is happening, maybe not fast enough, and other countries are, are clearly, you know, ahead of it. Um, you know, we're, you know we are, we're a private equity firm. We have 400,000 people working for our portfolio companies. The fastest growing spend for our companies is technology spend. Mm. It's uh, somewhere between really uh, growing fast or out of control, and there's an arms race to hire people in that area. And those that are well-educated in that area uh, are commanding very large uh, compensation packages and have their pick of jobs. Now, all of our companies, uh, technology is very important to all of our companies, but we don't really invest in technology businesses. So how do we get someone talented to work at our car wash company uh, or a chain of dental clinics as opposed to going to work for Google or Facebook. And that's one of the challenges that we are facing in attracting talent in a area in STEM, which is, which is very hot. And in general, you know, on a micro basis, we're in a full employment economy. We're in a mad contest just to get people to fill open slots in our business. Wonderful problem. We've dreamed about this problem. And what we as employers uh, hate is turnover. You spend a tremendous amount of time recruiting people and then training people. And if all of a sudden they call you and they say, well, someone else offered me $3 an hour more, I'm leaving. You've spent you know, six months and a fortune training them. So amidst the more macro issues facing us are, are, as businesses are, how do you hire and retain good people in this, in this fiercely competitive labor market. And Bar we're doing lots of things to, to try to address that. Barbara, what, what's your perspective on what, what, what the United States is getting wrong with STEM uh, education right now? I, I mean, I think we've got some experts here on the stage who are working hard on the, on, on the root causes here, you know, making sure that we get the right kind of curriculums in place, making sure that, uh, you know, that, that we have qualified teachers in place. But, but let me ask you a question. How early was it in your lives when you decided whether or not you were good at math? What if, what if you learned that anyone can learn math, no matter how old they are? What if we could actually develop technologies that are rooted in math and have mathematicians encapsulate their knowledge and capabilities, but make the user interface more intuitive and feel more like a video game. You know, I think there are several new ways that we can think about how to draw more people throughout their lives into careers that they might have traditionally thought they didn't qualify for. So I, I get it. We can, we can wring our hands over what's wrong with the system, or we can think differently about the future. Secretary, I know, I know you want to say something, but let me ask you as well, first of all, may the U.S. is a tremendously diverse country in terms of educational. It's, you know, education is very much a local uh, responsibility. And it does seem that sometimes efforts to um, establish national standards, President Bush's attempt famously, No Child Left Behind, meets a lot of resistance. And yet there is, there is surely a need, isn't there? Or maybe there isn't. But somehow if the United States is going to be able to compete and to produce workers who are going to be able to compete in this world, to have standards across the country to be ensure, to ensure that students are meeting those standards, whether they're in Wisconsin or Florida? Well, the educational community is one of the communities most resistant to change within our whole society, in my experience. I had a, 
the, the horrifying experience is they haven't adjusted and aren't even trying to adjust. Still in most high schools, the way the guidance counselor is judged and the way the school is judged is what percentage of your graduates go to college. That's one size fits all answer and it's a wrong answer. It should be what percentage of your students either go to college or get a good paying job. If we, start, if we don't get out of the wrong idea that one size fits all and college is the one size, that's one problem. Second problem is the teacher's preparation and the criteria for becoming a teacher do not involve embracing these newer concepts. They're still solving the old concepts. And that's a very, very big problem. The reason they're not teaching consumer computer science, they don't have teachers who are qualified to teach it. They, and that's true of a lot of things. Florida has made a big push toward a lot of sciences, including robotics. They've found one high school in Miami-Dade that's willing to put on a course in robotics. And that high school is doing it in cooperation with a local company. So what's really happened and it's the one really encouraging thing to me, community colleges are filling the breach. I, I had been in earlier years somewhat skeptical about community colleges, but they are the ones who are cooperating with industry to put on the programs. And some of them are doing it in a very enlightened fashion. There's one in Ohio called Cuyahoga Community College huge school, I think it has 50,000 students. They equipped a gigantic van as a classroom and they take the van to work sites so that workers who are in a combined job and earning, uh, job earning and, wor and work learning program don't have to spend a half hour, go to the place to get didactic input, they can do it at their workplace. That kind of thinking is very progressive and the community colleges are booming as a result and it's well justified. Without them, this problem would be far more severe than it already is. Problem is, that's late in life. These are kids already post high school. Mm. It would be much more efficient to get them at a much earlier age. Um, in, in the old days, moms would take their kid to the bank and the kid would see what does a deposit slip look like, what does a check look like. You, you have people coming into the workforce who don't know what a bank deposit is. They don't know what a check is. They don't know a lot of things. It's a very, very serious problem. So I think Financial illiteracy in the school systems is an even more fundamental problem. Benaz, you're going. So, Jerry, I just want to add to this. You know, your question about what's, what's wrong and what's happening, um, I think it's important for us as educators to connect the dots for the kids. And just as the secretary said, get to them at an earlier age. So not wait to the when they're in high school, when it's almost too late. You've got to engage them in elementary school and certainly by middle school and introduce them to these concepts like computer science. And, and we get to them by showing them how it's relevant to, to their life, right? Everybody walks around with an iPhone, everybody, the kids play video games. When I, when I talk with them and say, did you know that that video game was created by a knowledgeable person in STEM and someone had to be smart enough in order to come up with, with those ideas. And use that again as a way in which to engage them earlier on. If we do that, then we wouldn't run into the problem. And then the last thing I'll talk about in terms, of, uh, in terms of testing, we do need to have some level in which we can assess our children nationally. We have to have that. But the emphasis should not be on the tests, it should be on the content in which they need in order to succeed, whether it's going to college or go going into vocational school. But my premise is, being the CEO of the National Math and Science Initiative, 
is that whatever that training is, it has to embody STEM in some form or fashion. Jonathan, uh, let me ask you, um, as we broaden this out a little bit and look at um, the kind of skills that are going to be needed, how do we identify, as a, as a society, I mean, but also as companies and as individuals, how do we identify the kind of jobs and the kind of skills that are going to be needed to do those jobs in the next 5, 10, 15 years? With the pace of technological change so fast and seemingly continue to accelerate, what do we do? I mean, other than obvious things, like we know we need to be able to code and we know we need better understanding of math and science and engineering, how do we identify, how we, you know, on, a, on that kind of time frame, what kind of jobs are going to be, uh, are, are going to be done and what kind of skills are going to be needed? But just, if I may ask Jonathan that first, then Secretary, then you can respond, please. Look, in, in, among our employees, as I said, 400,000, uh, the, the bulk are, uh, the majority are kind of, you know, uh, you know low wage, relatively unskilled, and then a whole different category is the more, the, the feverish competition for the highly paid uh, skilled worker. But interestingly, the, the uh, millennial uh, worker that we are hiring by the hundreds of thousands is generally, you know, has a smartphone. And that's a pretty big differentiator in access to social media and technology, and that's a differentiator. And, uh, and, but, but as far as, you know, what, what we have to provide those people is not a job, but a career. Mm. They want uh, upward mobility, and uh, so they don't leave for the extra dollar an hour. And they're, they're very focused on uh, your, the employer having a higher purpose and a culture, and we spend tremendous amount of time uh, educating either potential uh, employees or existing on things like that. If you rank the top 10 uh, criteria that these employees value in their employer, number one is trust. Is it a trust-based employee? Does it have a higher purpose? Does it stand for something other than just making money? And as far as their own personal goals, uh, out of 10, uh, how much money they make is ranked seven out of ten. So it's just a, it's a dramatically different uh, job to hire, train, and retain the millennial workforce than we've had to deal with in the past, coupled with the fact that we uh, are in a full employment economy. And uh, the winner is the worker, is the employer, and our job is to you know, we, about 11 years ago, we made an investment in, in Whole Foods. We were the largest shareholder of Whole Foods, and they had built their business model by talking about a culture. If Safeway was paying $8 an hour, Whole Foods would pay $10 an hour. And they would, uh, you know, talk about their culture, and it was, it was a culture-based, worker-first mentality. So... Part of the challenge of these businesses is how do you get extraordinary performance out of unextraordinarily paid people, which is the huge part of the workforce. And there are ways to do it. You celebrate your employees. You give them awards. You have group meetings. You have communicate with them now you know, online. So there's so many things going on. Look, we have a lot of these people have not taken STEM, and so we have very inexpensive or free online programs we give them about personal wellness, about how to lose weight, about how to manage your finances, about how to deposit a check. And where. So there's so many things today that we can provide to our workforce on a very affordable basis that they can access on their smartphone that is the transformation in, in the whole workforce that I think is empowering and exciting. And again, may not get to the heart of the STEM issue uh, because STEM has, as I mentioned, like I'm on the board of, of my college, we can't recruit enough STEM professors, and there's an issue because you want to get one, you have to pay them 20% more than the English professor, and you're messing up the whole pay scale, but they're doing it because they need the professors because the demand for the courses is so great, we don't have enough professors to teach the courses. Right. And when applicants apply to your school, they want to say, how are you in STEM? What are your STEM courses like? Who are your professors? I want to go sit in on your STEM course. And you better have it, or they're going to go somewhere else. Mm. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me ask you, how effective is, retra can, can, is retraining in practice, and how effective can it be uh, in principle? Again, technology is advancing dramatically. Lots of jobs are becoming obsolete, or going to be done by machines or AI. Um, 
what can you do? Take, for example, truck drivers. We're all, this, is the, this is the phenomenon everybody's very focused on right now. Tr truck drivers, millions of truck drivers in this country, uh, depending on who you listen to, in 10, 20, 30 years' time, it's all going to be automated driving. Wh and those are people who have real good-paying jobs right now whose jobs are going to essentially, as drivers, dis dis disappear. How does... You know, how much attention are we paying to retraining existing workers so that they can either do a different version of the job that they're doing or that they can be, they, we can help them to be placed in some completely different uh, working environment? Well, we're, we're paying a lot of attention, and to put some numbers to it, there are 2.75 million adults who earn their living driving a truck. Right. Not all over the road, some are the delivery trucks. Right. That's a lot of people. And in many cases, it's not just their income statement that's at risk, it's the balance sheet, because a lot of them are independent contractors who own their own vehicle, usually with a bank debt attached to it. So when you knock them out with an autonomous vehicle, you've hurt not just the income statement, but the balance sheet. That's one of the biggest single problems we're going to have to face. Um, but. Think about it, as we get more sophisticated equipment, there's also more need for people to maintain the equipment. The, the things are complicated, and they take different skills to maintain, so there is room. I don't think we should all become Luddites and go back to 19th century England where they were destroying factories because factories were gonna be the end of artisan workers, it turned out factories were the best thing in the world right. for artists and workers. I think it will be that way here, but only because we're trying to get ahead of the curve. And that's where the resistance of the educational community is so annoying. There's instance after instance where employers are saying, look, we need someone to give soft skills to the kids, because soft skills are some of the ones we're talking about. Right we'll provide you with someone from our company to do it and won't even charge for it. Average principal says, no, 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 that's against state law. You must be a registered teacher, you must be a this, you must be a that. There's a huge bureaucracy that's set up to protect the existing system and is totally ignoring the rest of it. Think about it, when have you heard elementary school faculties or secondary school faculties talk the way that he's talking or the way that any of us are talking. It's almost as though they're defining their constituency to be the protection of teachers rather than the enhancement of the children. Barbara, as a major manufacturer, you're obviously going through, uh, and, and, you know, at the cutting edge of technology too, going through a lot of technological change, a lot of automation, a lot of implementation of AI. What, 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 are you, what, are, what have you done? How effective is reskilling, re retraining? What can you do? What, what can be, we're having a problem with your mic, I think. What can be done? What, what are you doing? And what can we learn from what you're doing and what others can do to, 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 to again, to, to reskill the existing workforce so they're going to be able to do the kind of jobs that are going to actually be available in 10 years' time? Yeah, thanks. It, yeah, think about the employment equation. Does the, does the career belong to the individual or to the company? We feel strongly that individuals own their careers, but we have a vested interest as a company to make some tools available to people so that they can learn along with us as we're developing new technologies in the marketplace. So I'll give you an example. Everything is going digital, whether it's power, infrastructure, healthcare, everything that we're working on with our customers is going digital. So one of the things we've instituted is a digital readiness check. It's an online rubric that, you know, we can all take this assessment and say, hey, how am I doing? And then, then the system will, you know, offer up some suggested training. If an employee takes ownership and shows that kind of initiative, we're bringing those tools to the table for them to be able to develop their careers as they go. But back to the subject of apprenticeship, this is a concept that can be game-changing for us. Now, Siemens, of course, with our deep heritage in Europe, has a, a very well-established apprenticeship system in Germany and elsewhere around the world. We actually brought that system here to the US when we needed to 
build a workforce for a gas plant in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the, it has been something that allowed us to work closely with the Department of Labor and with Commerce. We've got a playbook now that others can use, and we have apprentices who are experiencing the hands-on learning that is so essential, especially for adult learning, I believe. So I was, um, I was really pleased to hear from one of our employees, a woman in Ohio who is mid-career and said, I signed up for an apprenticeship because I decided it's time for me to take that next step and tune up my skills. So Jerry, I think that what we've got to do as employers is it's in our own best interests, as Jonathan says, for us to be providing a framework that ensures our workforce can perform and deliver. But boy, I think there's a lot of ownership on the individual to own their own career. But now, can I ask you, how do we need to think, change the way we think about education uh, from a lifetime perspective? And the traditional view of education for at least, say, the last 100 years has been you go to school, you go to grade school, and then you go to high school, and then a proportion goes to college, and a smaller proportion goes on to postgraduate education. And at you know, 18 or 22 or 25, 26, you enter the workforce, and you stay in the workforce, that's it. You've acquired your, you, know, you may get some training, on-the-job training, whatever, but basically you've acquired your educational um, attainment until you retire at 67. How much is that going to need to change? Are we going to, maybe people are going to be taking educate, you know, whether it's whatever you want to describe it as diplomas or apprenticeships or degrees in their 30s and 40s. Are we going to, in say, 100 years' time, have a radically different approach towards, we are, we, the, towards the way in which we look at education? If I understand your question right, you know, things are going to be Different, right? Yeah. It's not, I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean are, are, people, exactly. are people going to exactly. be leaving the workforce and going back into college at 40, 50? Well, we, see, we see that happening right now, right? Yeah. Um, I have some good friends that work for ExxonMobil. They have been there for 31 years or 40 years in one position. That's not going to happen anymore. I think right now, I think I heard the uh, statistics is maybe uh, you will stay in a job four or five years and then you move on. So that means for me that there is always this opportunity or a need to continually have a way in which to train the workforce and to retrain the workforce. Um, and, and so how do you do that? And why do you do that? So again, I'll go back to my, my tenant that uh, whatever that training is, it needs to be involved in some type of math and science training because chances are you're gonna be moving perhaps from a manufacturing job that's more manual to one that involves you working with robotics, and so now you've got to train around that. So we need to look for novel ways in which to not only provide the basic training for our workforce, but also a way in which to retrain them as they change their positions, change their jobs, change their ambitions, change their dreams about what they want to do. Second. Two things we're trying to do to affect that evolution. One is making it simpler for industry groups and unions to issue certification, accredited certification. That does two things. One, it gives the worker portability, because now he's a certified welder or a certified code writer or whatever. Second, and maybe more importantly, it's sort of a social status. It's not a college degree, but it's something that he can, and they often do, frame and put on their wall. It makes them feel more complete as people. Second thing is internet delivery of many of these kinds of curricula. There's a lot of room for that. So far, again, the public school system been very resistant to that, but it's, it's silly that the least productivity increases of most major parts of the economy have come in education. There's very little productivity increase because they're not taking advantage of new ways of doing things. And so it, I think the solutions are within sight, but we need the cooperation of a big segment that so far is not engaged oh, yeah. Yeah. in the same discussion that we are. The last thing is we really need to change terminology. The very term blue-collar worker has become a pejorative term. White collar worker is a affirmative term. We need to have different language because language colors people's thinking. And we're using obsolete thinking. 
there are probably more high-tech people wearing blue college shirts than there are wearing <laughs> white college shirts. So it isn't even fitting. Some, did you think about that when you chose your shirt today? <laughs> some, <laughs> some, including me. Some of them don't wear shirts at all, I think, from what I've seen. But uh, Jonathan, you, you wanted to say. Yeah, okay, I just want to say, again, uh, our, our companies tend to, when, when people, we hire them, they've already been educated in whatever manner they have, and then it's our job to train them and, and educate them further. But, but again, part of what we focus a lot on are, are role models and mentors and career advancement. And a, lo a lot of that is helped with uh, storytelling. And, and whether someone has a college degree or not, it, you know, we have someone who, who started flipping burgers at a Shake Shack, who, uh, a diversity employee, who's now running a district with 20 stores making $200,000. We'll have someone who started as a checker at Whole Foods, an immigrant, no education, who's running a $100 million store. Someone who started out washing cars, who's, and so we're, there's so many wonderful stories in, in business today about advancement and growth and building a career and people being able to have families and support themselves, and I think that's, a, that's kind of the circle of life of business, but it's important as an employer to focus on that and to communicate to even your entry-level people that there is that path forward. And there's something to look forward to, even if you're not a coder right. or you're not a Harvard Business School. But, you know, Harvard Business School, my, my son graduated Harvard Business School, fancy schmancy, and I think the average length of duration of the first job out of Harvard Business School is something like two years. And then they switch. And that's just another phenomenon where even the super educated are, you know, you're saying no one's staying at Exxon 30 years. Right. But, you know, how do you try to minimize that as an em employer? And maybe in the tech world, it's, it's most pronounced where people hop around. The most educated, the most stemmed are hopping around every minute. So can I ask you all, um, some of the more pessimistic futurists would say a lot of this conversation is pointless because if you believe the potential of AI and machine learning, you know, going to replace most of the jobs that are, that are done right now, there are wildly varying estimates as to whether it's between 15% and 40 or 50% of the existing jobs that in the workforce that are going to be displaced by machines or by artificial intelligence. But, I mean, Barbara, maybe I'll start with you. I mean, where's, what's your sense of how... Uh, how extreme that is and how, how radical a change that is going to be and how many people are going to need to be completely reskilled. So everybody who knows me will say, I, she doesn't see the glass half full, she sees it overflowing. So I just will preface my words with I'm, a, I'm a, an optimist. I think from the time a human first picked up a rock and used it as a tool, the role of the human has been changed. And I think the tools we're talking about today are no different than those rocks of old. We're, we're bringing new tools into our workplaces, and humans are so creative, we're going to continue to find new things to do, new ways to serve, new ways to extend our own passion and dreams. Jonathan, do you, do you have a sense of how advanced this is going to be? This well, look, I mean, I, I think, AI you know, is going to be? business is very creative, inventive, uh, you know, business has evolved forever. I mean, we have, look, now on one hand, we have the combination of rising wages. So if, if wages were eight, a minimum was $8 an hour, and we were paying $10 an hour as an enlightened employer, we felt great about yourselves. Well, now it's $15 an hour. And by the way, we've seen if you pay 16 versus 15, there's no increase in productivity. So what are we trying to do realistically? We're trying to reduce the number of people that work for us because it's a lot more expensive. And that's where technology comes in. And we're trying to automate and you know, we've, we've eliminated cashiers in you know, thousands of cashiers in so many of our places. But there seem to be other jobs that are being created by our wonderful inventive economy and we still have full employment and wage pressures. Right. So now, by the way, if this is all happening and we go through some great downturn, that might be a challenge because then people are on the street and whatnot. But right now, the combination of wage pressure and technology, I think, is, is, is generating a lot of new you know, replacements for labor, but then opportunities for, for new jobs. So it's exciting. It's a vibrant, it's a vibrant time. Secretary, are you fundamentally optimistic that the, there will be 
plentiful work still to go around. Was saying, one of the reasons mm -hmm. truckers, they but, can't find, people just don't want to be a truck driver. Sure, sure. They want to be something else. But there are, and those jobs, you double those jobs, their pay, those jobs they may are not want to be Those jobs are going to go away. I just want to get a sense of, you know, I mean, there's people talk, we need to address this by things like universal basic income and all that. You think that the, 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 there isn't going to be a fundamental rupture in the nature of the labor market, that we aren't going to have prolonged period of extended unemployment for a lot of people who no, are No, I, I really don't think so. To put it in perspective, after all the chatter, right now there are 200 robots per 10,000 workers in American factories. 200 per 10,000. If you double that, it's not the end of the earth. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to put it in perspective. And when the newspapers play up, 25% of the jobs will go away. They don't say that the forecast said over 20 years or 25 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. But first of all, anybody who thinks he can accurately forecast 25 years needs retraining himself. <laughs> okay. I have a tough time trying to forecast two years out let alone 25 years. So I think it's very easy to overstate and become too alarmist. Plus, we're moving to try to deal with it. If we were not doing anything, it'd be a different story. This government is moving to try to deal with it. And that's what get, that combination of that, plus that we're at such an early stage, is what gives me hope that the doom and gloom things are way overstated. When you talk to these economists or these experts in technology and AI, they say, well, the kind of there are, there are clearly going to be many jobs that are still going to need to be done by humans. And they are what you touched on this earlier, Secretary, so-called sort of soft, require soft skills. A lot of it is going to be about human connection, a lot of it much more in healthcare and in count, sure. counseling and in personal uh, services and that kind of stuff. Jonathan, maybe I'll ask you and the others too, because we're going to wrap up anyway in a second. So maybe all this focus on st having a huge number of people who are very qualified in STEM and in being able to write code, maybe, if I may say provocatively, maybe it's, that's, not, that's not the answer. Maybe what we really need is people who are going to be able to you know, care for people when they're sick, people who are sure. going to be able to provide personal services. Sure. Um, let me ask Jonathan first and, then I, and the others, and then I'll let you wrap up, uh, yeah. Secretary. You know, should we be... That looks, that looks to be where the jobs are in, in kind of well, interhuman, for example, interpersonal uh, relationships. Where our jobs are, you know... Our job is to invest in the companies of tomorrow and try to see around the corner where the consumer is spending money. So 10 years ago, the majority of our portfolio was retailers. And we did very well in such Petco and Whole Foods and other retailers. And we saw the world was changing. And today, 3% of our portfolio is retailers. Mm. And it's a, it's a tough space. And 63% of our portfolio broadly defined are service companies where you're providing a service to someone that's hard to deliver on a phone or online or through a delivery. Mm. And those uh, companies are where the consumer is spending money today. And, and there are some unskilled workers, there's some skilled workers, but the shift towards a services-based economy has been dramatic and been fortunate for us that we have a lot of these companies where you want this, we have, we're big in the in the, some of the gym and fitness uh, space as well, where you can sometimes get something on an app, but some people want to go to a place and have someone, you know, work them out or give them a massage or therapy or whatever. So there's lots of services that are being provided, and there's probably quietly a massive retraining that has been going on for the past decade to, take it to, to, re, to deal with that massive shift in consumer spending patterns. Barbara, do we all need to be therapists and personal trainers? I don't know. I want to know. I, I'm dying to hear your opinion about this, Bernard, because you've been so passionate about getting us all trained in science and technology. As I was listening to this dialogue, I was just thinking about something that I showed on the slide earlier, that we are trying to prepare our kids in elementary schools for jobs that don't exist yet. Right. How do we, how do, we do that? We're talking about this whole reframing and that. So we do that by making sure that we understand what are the basic skills that a person needs. I was at a uh, conference a few weeks ago where the speaker said that it's not about knowledge, it's about know-how. Mm -hmm. And so we need to teach uh, our workforce, starting with our children, uh, not only knowledge but the know-how in order to, to pivot as they will, as we've already alluded to, that they're going to have to. Yeah. in the 21st century. That's right, learning how to learn. And, and I'll just quote the movie Ready Player One, right? 
<laughs> What's so cool about the real world? Well, it's where you can get a good meal. <laughs> I, at, a, at a certain point, all this digital stuff is fascinating, but we still come back to the physical world where we have to interact in so, 3D. Sorry, Barbara, thank you. Secretary, so, so <laughs> I want to give you the last word. Uh, I want to invite you, obviously, you'll, you'll have a number of things to say, but I want to ask you, so you come back here in five years' time as Secretary of Commerce and right at the end of the second Trump administration, <laughs> what, will you want, what, will you, what would you have wanted to see from your... Uh, workforce advisory board, what, what progress do, would you think over five years would represent measurable success? Well, first of all, I hope artificial intelligence will be applied to the United States Congress. <laughs> We've tried everything else, and I think it may be time for that. <laughs> More to the point, nobody talks about the whole new industries that are going to create vast jobs. Space. Space is now a $400 billion industry. We think it'll be a $4 trillion industry. All sorts of new things are gonna be open there. Obviously, isn't time to talk, but technology is not just a job killer. It opens up whole new horizons, and we shouldn't forget about that uh, as well. So I think the best thing of progress would be if we start penetrating the educational system, start getting kids brought into the skills they need and match that with continuation of apprenticeships and the other programs. This, is not, this problem has been decades in the making, not gonna get solved in 10 minutes. Well, on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard lots of ideas about progress in the American workforce. We've all got to go and work, uh, but for the time being, please join me in thanking our panel very much for their contribution.